of Matthew, the 12th chapter of Matthew, and beginning at verse 38. Somebody asked me what version I'm using. I'm using the same one Paul used, the King James Version. <laughs> you know, we have so many versions today that you can stand up and quote Scripture, and if you misquote it, they think you're using another version. And uh, it's very interesting. I have, I guess, well, I guess my wife and I must have 25 different versions. Well, I'm going to the King James Version as I normally do in my preaching. I like a, a number of the versions, and they throw a lot of light on it. And I heard the story that someone told about uh, the Apostle Paul had received, oh, pardon me, Timothy had received a letter from the Apostle Paul. And behind him were two donkeys loaded down with baggage, and they said, what is all that? They said, well, these are the commentaries to tell you what Paul is saying in that letter. <laughs> then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we want to see you do a sign. We want a sign. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall be no sign given it but the sign of the prophet Jonah. Isn't it strange that Jesus would use Jonah? He didn't tell us not to believe the story of Jonah. He accepted the fact that Jonah had been swallowed by a whale or a ship or a big fish. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He was using that as an illustration of his own death and resurrection. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, a greater than Jonah is here. Remember when Jonah preached to Nineveh? And Nineveh was a great city of several hundred thousand people, and the greatest revival of all time took place when that entire city turned to God in repentance. They repented of their sins, and everyone in the whole city turned to God. And God spared that city the judgment. And I've been praying for America. Oh, God, spare America, because we see the possibilities of our world being destroyed, not only in atomic war, but also by AIDS and other things that are gripping our world at the moment. The Queen of the South shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, for she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. But behold, a greater than Solomon is here. How could a greater than Solomon ever come? I want to talk about that tonight. I want to use Solomon's life as an illustration of the lives of Americans today and American young people. Because you see, Solomon was a man of great knowledge. And we look on every hand today and we see young people seeking knowledge, security, love. It seems that they are on a great quest. Young people seek to define themselves in terms of clothes they wear. And we hear that the miniskirt is on the way back and the crowd they run with, and the things they buy, and the places they go, and the rock concerts they attend. But many of our young people today are lonely. And I was talking to the dean of one of our great Eastern universities, and I said, what is the greatest problem on this campus? He said, lack of purpose and meaning. That was Dr. Bach at Harvard University. Now, the results of, jo of Solomon's search were expressed time after time. He said, vanity of vanities, life is nothing but a vanity. And the word vanity means a bubble that burst. He sought pleasure by every conceivable means, but it was nothing but a bursting bubble. Solomon had it all. And at the end, he said, it's not worth it. First, Solomon attained great knowledge. He knew more than any man that ever lived except Jesus Christ. He said, I've gotten more wisdom than all they that have been before me and all of those that are going to follow me. In Ecclesiastes 1.16. In 1 Kings 4.30, it says, Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the East and all the wisdom of Egypt. 
He said, I gave my heart to know wisdom, and I perceive that this also is vexation of spirit, for in much wisdom and knowledge there is much grief. He said, you can know it all. Have all the knowledge and have all the PhDs and all the rest, but it doesn't satisfy something deep inside our hearts and our souls. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And the struggle intensifies around the globe right now for the hearts and minds of youth. But Christ said we're to love God with our heart, soul, strength, and mind. And you cannot come to God alone through your mind. Our natural minds have been affected by sins. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 3, 14, their minds were blinded. In 2 Corinthians 4, 4, the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not. The God of this world is the devil. The Bible teaches there is a devil. There are demons. And they have the power to blind your mind towards spiritual things. In the futility of their thinking, they are darkened in their understanding, says Paul in Ephesians, the fourth chapter. Now that's the New International Version, by the way, that particular scripture I just quoted. Now the Bible teaches in Titus 1 that our minds are defiled. In Daniel 5, it says they're filled with pride. In 1 Timothy 6, 5, it says they're corrupt. In Ephesians 4, it says they're filled with vanity. In Proverbs 21, it says they're wicked. With all of our stockpiles of knowledge, do you know what we've learned? We've learned something that Adam and Eve did not know in the Garden of Eden. We've learned the knowledge of evil. Adam and Eve gained the knowledge of evil when they sinned against God. God never meant that we were to know what evil was. He created us perfect human beings. We were to live thousands of years on this planet. We were to build a wonderful world with God's help. But we rebelled against God. And we gained the knowledge of evil. And now we've reached the point in civilization where with all of our knowledge, we have now invented the atomic bomb and the hydrogen bomb and chemical weapons and computers and all the rest that make it so that man can be wiped out in a matter of hours. What can we do? Receive Christ. Let him dominate your mind. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. The scripture says you can be transformed in your thinking. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Give your mind to Christ. Yes, there's going to be peace because Christ is the Prince of Peace. He's going to bring peace. But only through God are we going to find peace. You can have peace in your heart right now. You can have peace of mind right now by surrendering your life and your heart to Jesus Christ. The Bible says God made the wisdom of this world look foolish. The world failed to find him by its wisdom and he chose to save those who have faith in the folly of the gospel. Notice he calls the gospel folly. The gospel is folly to this world that has its mind blinded and affected by the devil. You see, sin is a disease. It's also a disease of the mind. It's worse than Alzheimer's disease or any other disease that you can think of. It's destructive, and we all have it. The Bible says all have sinned. What can we do about it? Come to the cross. Let Christ forgive your sins, change your life, turn you in a new direction, and give you a new mind because Christ can become the Lord of your mind as well as your body and as well as your soul. And then Solomon was not only the smartest man and the most brilliant man that ever lived and the best educated, but he gave himself to great pleasures. In Ecclesiastes 2, 1, he said, I said in my heart, go to now, I will prove thee with laughter, therefore I'm going to enjoy pleasure. He had every sensual pleasure that you can imagine. The Bible describes in details all that he had. He had the finest swimming pool you've ever read about. It was flanked by 12 lions of gleaming bronze. He drank the finest wines in golden goblets. He had 700 wives 
and 300 concubines. Talk about sex. He had it. More than any of you will ever have. And every pleasure that you could think of was at his beck and call. He did what many of you would like to do, but you can't afford it. Some people are good because they can't afford to be bad. But God doesn't count that. Some sin is expensive. With every imaginable device of pleasure and lust at his fingertips, Solomon sat out under the stars one night and contemplated the emptiness of it all. He said, vanity of vanities, it's all vanity. It's a bubble that burst. How many of you are crying tonight on the inside? On the outside, you have a mask inside the peace and the joy and the happiness that you've always searched for is missing. Something's wrong in your marriage. Something's wrong in your courtship. Something's wrong in your school. Something's wrong in your life. Something's wrong between you and your parents. Something's wrong between you and your friends. Something's just missing in your life. Do you know Christ? Do you have the joy and the peace that he can bring? Because in him are the pleasures that you can have. And then Solomon was the richest man in the history of the world. His income was staggering. It's all listed in the Bible. The weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year was 603 score and six talents of gold. That's billions of dollars. Did you know he had a stable of 40,000 horses? But one night he sat on the top of his house in Lebanon. And with indigestion, his hand clutched at his empty heart, and he said, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. It's all a bubble that burst. It's nothing. All this pleasure, all these riches and everything are nothing. The Bible says in Psalm 37, a little that a righteous man hath is better than the riches of many wicked. I'd rather be as poor as Job's turkey and know Christ than to be the richest man in the whole world without Christ. In Proverbs 23, he wrote, Wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings, and they fly away like an eagle. Jesus said, Beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. And we look on Wall Street. Sometimes they show those pictures of those men going crazy. Just, I don't know how they keep up with it all. But people go crazy over money.